All right, here we go. Welcome everybody. Um, really appreciate y'all joining us tonight. My name is Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, tonight, I'm really excited to be here with authors Ben Lorber and Shane Burley, uh, whose new book, Safety Through Solidarity, A Radical Guide to Fighting Anti-Semitism, uh, came out uh, last month. Ben and Shane are joined by our friend and occasional collaborator, uh, Cindy Baruch Milstein, who has generously offered to facilitate tonight's uh, timely conversation on anti-Semitism. So just a little bit of background. Uh, Firestorm is a 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective uh, here in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. And you may already know, we uh, tend to do a fair few of these events online, uh, both because it gives us a chance to host authors who might otherwise not make it to the East Coast of North America. Um, and also because we know that there's lots of folks right here in Asheville who um, aren't able to uh, attend in-person events due to various barriers, including COVID. So if you're interested in keeping up with our uh, future events, both virtual and in person, I'd encourage you to follow us on social media and I will be sure to share our newsletter in the chat. So tonight we are using Zoom's Q&A tool um, and uh, that'll allow you to ask questions as we go. I would encourage folks um, as things come up, go ahead and jot out those questions. We're gonna try and leave some space at the end to come back to uh, audience questions. And just in general, I guess I will say um, that, you know, this is a webinar, it's, it's somewhat less interactive, I think, than uh, some other formats, which um, has pros and cons. Um, I, I think I saw someone with their hand raised earlier and just uh, please uh, bear with us here because our, our intention really is uh, to use that webinar format, um, which uh, does mean that your primary opportunity to kind of engage the speakers uh, is through the Q&A. So we're gonna get started. Um, ben Lover is a senior uh, research analyst at Political Research Associates, a social movement think tank, uh, where he studies and publishes on anti-Semitism and white nationalism. He previously worked as national campus organizer with Jewish Voice for Peace, supporting justice-driven young Jewish communities across the country, and has written extensively on anti-Semitism, Israel, Palestine, and Jewish identity. Shane Burley has contributed uh, to places such as NBC News, Jewish Currents, Al Jazeera, The Baffler, The Daily Beast, Haaretz, In These Times, Yes Magazine, Tikkun, and the Oregon Historical Quarterly, or excuse me, Quarter. Uh, their previous books on the far right and social movements include No Pasaron, Anti-Fascist Dispatches from a World in Crisis, and Why We Fight, Essays on Fascism, Resistance, and Surviving the Apocalypse. And I'm pretty sure we have one or both of those books covered in past conversations uh, on our YouTube channel. So definitely, if you enjoy this, go back to the archive and listen to some more great conversations with Shane. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, um, Cindy Baruch Milstein uh, is uh, a diasporic uh, queer Jewish anarchist and longtime organizer. They've been writing on anarchism for over two decades and are the author of Anarchism and Its Aspirations and Try Anarchism for Life, The Beauty of Our Circle, which is one of my favorite books to recommend to people who are newly interested in anarchism. Uh, they also have edited several anthologies, including most recently Constellations of Care, Anarcho-Feminism in Practice, um, and one of our favorites, Deciding for Ourselves, The Promise of Direct Democracy. Y'all, thanks so much for being here with us tonight. Um, I think we're all really looking forward to hearing from you. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pass it off to Cindy. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Liberty. Um, really wanna thank uh, Liberty, a dear friend and Firestorm Books for hosting this and uh, lots of other crucial conversations. Um, I was just uh, in Asheville about 10 days ago or so, and I wish we could be in Firestorm. If you ever have a chance to go there in person, it's an incredible space. and um, bookstore and a real uh, community hub that um, 
help sustain a lot of movements and solidarity efforts. So, and I really want to thank uh, Shane and Ben for bringing this book into the world. If, uh, um, and it's coincidentally at precisely the moment when it's, uh, I think, extra needed. And I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm mostly going to be asking them questions. So I will start off with kind of a basic one, um, which is looking at where the book came from. Um, and I want to ask you to um, what compelled both of you, um, both politically and personally, to write this book? And can you give us an overview of it, kind of explaining some of its unique perspectives and key assertions? Sure, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, thanks so much, Cindy, for being here and being in conversation. Again, we've had great conversations like this yeah. before in the past. Big thanks to Firestorm. I think, you know, it's it's important for us to be connected with independent booksellers, with radical booksellers, because these are such important community spaces, even beyond just uh, books. These are places where we meet um, both online and in person. And so I, I think it's important folks thinking about buying the book, definitely go to Firestorm and connect with them. It's a great place to, to purchase books in general and keep it going. Um, I think when it you know, and I'll give Ben a lot of credit here because Ben reached out to me with an idea like this. And so I think Ben, in a way, had the idea percolating before we had even talked about it. But I think for both of us, I know for me in particular, we were looking to unpack a sort of new trajectory for talking about anti-Semitism. We both talked about anti-Semitism in our work, anti-fascist work, talking about the far right. And also uh, in organizing in the left, both obviously in Palestine solidarity movements and others, where we wanted nuanced conversations on what anti-Semitism is, and that's exactly what we usually don't get. So overwhelmingly, the conversation on anti-Semitism is driven by large organizations that are very invested both in the police state and also Israeli nationalism. And us as people who come from a very critical position of that, but also take anti-Semitism seriously, seriously, have seen how it plays out as a motivating factor in the far right, how it can even play out in the left sometimes through conspiracy theories and other things. And so we wanted to actually bring that conversation back into the left. And so we built the book around how we understand these different histories of anti-Semitism on the one hand, and then how to build alliances with other folks facing you know, marginalization from white Christian supremacy and from the kind of unequal, unequal institutions of capitalism. How can we build alliances that will fight those because we see those as a shared sort of source of these oppressions, both anti-Semitism and otherwise. And so if we understand that being the case, then I think we have to have a totally different kind of uh, program for how we deal with this than what we're being offered by these organizations. So this is just sort of like our first step to try and think through doing that. And hopefully in doing so, you know, we, we talked to, you know, not nearly 200 folks, organizers, folks on the ground, and then also kind of tried to dig into different histories of some social movements that have done it well, maybe who haven't done it as well, and see what what's there to kind of learn from and when we're building into the future. You know, ben, yeah. what do you think of this? Yeah, that's a really good, really good summary, Shane. Um, just like, also, yeah, really great to be here. Cindy, really like honored to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Firestorm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that Shane and I share in common is, you know, you, you asked Cindy what personally has motivated us. And I think, you know, when we connected around this in 2019 and 2020, we both, shared an experience that like you probably have shared and many Jews on the left have shared of just, you know, on the one hand, well, being a Jew on Turtle Island, being a Jew in this country, being a Jew in this world, you know, facing um, anti-Semitism and caring about it. Um, and also being being on the left and feeling almost the, the, the loneliness, um, you know, to make it really personal and also just the lack of understanding often, the, the, the gap in so many people's analysis of, uh, you know, what is anti-Semitism? Um, how does it relate to the other structures of oppression that we see um, in the world around us? How can we understand it um, intersectionally? I think, I think Shane and I both have had many experiences um, on the left of just wanting to see this analysis and not really seeing it, right? Um, and, you know, that, you know, th that really became a crisis, I think, uh, with the rise of, of Trumpism and the alt-right when, yeah. you know, anti-Semitism um, all of a sudden was 
um, undeniable, you know, you know, you know, helping to motivate, you know, fascism. The, you know, these conspiracy theories of George Soros and globalists were all over the right wing um, media were voiced from the president. You know, we it was clear to all of us that anti-Semitism was helping to fuel the right. Um, and also Shane and I, and I'm sure you and many others, you know, as Jews who want justice in Palestine, we could just see the way that accusations of anti-Semitism were used to kneecap our movements, were used to you know, to stifle voices. I mean, I um you know, I was a uh, I worked for JVP as a campus um, organizer, and you know, Shane also has has done BDS work on campus, and just seeing Palestinians and their allies just be slandered as as anti-Semitic for simply wanting Boeing to stop you know, dropping bombs on their their families' villages, right? So, so all of these things we knew we needed to make an, an intervention, and um, the only books out there on anti-Semitism were not so great, right? It was Barry Weiss's <laughs> book. It was Deborah Lipstadt's book, right? So we really saw like a void. And so that was that was part of what made us want to, to write this. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you both for, for sharing, especially but the po politics and the personal. We really appreciate that and really definitely resonated with me too as, as a Jew in this time period. Um, and uh, maybe for another sort of question before we get into sort of more the heart of some of the some of the conversation is um it really kind of struck me when I got the book of the timing of the publication seemed so poignant um coming out in the midst of this relentless genocide in Gaza that's uh, breaking so many of our hearts um the remarkably strong and diverse Palestinian solidarity actions around the globe which have been um incredibly um long-lived and, and and inspiring, um, even if we haven't been able to stop the genocide, and um, the increasingly palpable grasp of Christo-fascism here on Turtle Island, um, really evidenced um, in the RNC last week. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if any of this has sort of shifted your thinking, just the timing of the book um, coming out now, and, and or anything about how the book's been received so far that's surprised you or impacted you? Because I know it wasn't really, planned necessarily when you started thinking about it, as you mentioned, almost oh, five years ago, um, working on the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, like you said, it's definitely, you know, um, we didn't intend for, uh, for this timing to happen. Uh, and we were lucky enough that our, you know, it was, you know, it was, it was, uh, the final draft was due in October. And luckily, um, our editor, you know, agreed with us when we emailed the, the, them and said, yeah, yeah you know, can we add in like a little bit to update, you know, to reflect what's happening right now? Um, and yeah, I mean, I, um, I'm i not sure, you know, if anything is even so fundamental has has changed about the analysis in the book. I think um, in a way, all the events that have unfolded since October 7th have really just kind of you know, raised the stakes and driven home what so many of us on the left have long you know, known about you know, anti-Semitism, right? We've seen the state, um, you know, centrist organizations, right-wing organizations like the ADL, you know, and uh, Jewish institutions um, and Christian Zionists um, and elected officials on both sides of the aisle, really just more than ever before, you know, weaponizing um, anti-Semitism to try to stifle the the movement, right? Um, and sending, you know, threatening to send in the National Guard, right? Sending in cops, you know, to clear um, encampments because that supposedly keeps Jews safe, right? Uh, bombing Gaza to oblivion because th that supposedly keeps Jews safe, right? Um, we, yeah, the the, 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 the the stakes are really like a lot higher. And I, and I think it's made a lot of people really hungry after this conversation. Like we know we need like another narrative out there uh, on what anti-Semitism is. Also, seeing on the left, you know, sometimes people getting kind of stuck in like a defensive posture where we're only able to say what anti-Semitism um, is not, but we don't have like an analysis of what it is, or we down downplay what it or what it actually is. Uh, and we're not always looking at the ways it can it can show up in our own movements, or um, it can show up in online um, on on social media. Um, so yeah, I think everything that's happened is really just kind of it driven home um, how important it is for new left analysis on this stuff. But I don't know, Shane, what do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I generally agree with what you're saying. I think that, and we talked about this too, in like the months after we kind of turned in first drafts before the book comes out, because I think there's a certain impulse to basically say this changes everything. Um, and so we had to ask that tough question a lot, like, does, what does this change? And I think it actually just drew out a few threads in the book to the surface. And we'll probably talk about this more as we talk about the book. But we talk about, for example, how like particularly the American right, both is sort of this bastion of pro-Israel sentiment on the one hand and is baked in with really implicit anti-Semitic conspiracy theories or Christian nationalist ideas or Christian Zionist ideas that are directly in opposition to Jewish safety and, and kind of future and, and, and flourishing. And that was especially true the last nine months and became incredibly obvious that a lot of the politicians that were basically ringing the bell about campus anti-Semitism on the one hand are talking about white genocide on the other, or other anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are talking about George Soros, even using anti-Semitic conspiracy theories to basically defend Israel, like to say that the campus protests are funded by George Soros, that kind of thing. And I think that that was really made obvious. The other thing was that organizations like the Anti-Defamation League that dominate, overwhelmingly dominate our discussions on anti-Semitism were such a catastrophic failure the last nine months in the way they slandered campus movements, Palestinian organizations, Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, and when you look at like their records and how they're actually analyzing this, you can see very clearly that this sort of um, mixing of rhetoric, this blame, calling anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism has totally shifted the conversation. So instead, we're having this uproar about, you know, what college sophomores are saying on campus, while like basically the death count of a genocide that's U.S. funded and supported is, is just kind of going less reported in comparison. So I think all those things came up really clearly. One thing I think that is that does get me thinking kind of about the future was that we talk about and we close the book by talking about the historic Jewish left and the historic Jewish left has, has made talking about anti-Semitism. That was a really important issue going back decades. And there's subsequent generations of Jewish leftists that have made this an important point. Jewish feminist movements, anti-fascists, the Jewish new left and Jewish anti-war movement. And we've seen a massive explosion of the of Jewish left organizing large organizations, Jewish Voice for Peace and other ones. And that's also in a way bringing the conversation about those issues back to the fold, but it's doing it explicitly in solidarity with Palestine. So I actually think in a way, some of those things we talk about as like high points or places that we could grow, they actually are growing now. And so I think that's a, that's a positive change. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you both. That was really thoughtful, <laughs> really provocative to hear you both speak about that um, so much as, because like so much has happened the last nine months, it's been hard to kind of process a lot of it. It was really helpful to think think through that while you're talking. Um, um, I'm going to kind of step into the book. Um, I, I really want to encourage people to get it and read it, whether you're Jewish or not. I especially want to also encourage people that aren't Jewish to read it. This is um, one thing that's really striking to the about the book is um, there's an extensive um, whole section of the book that looks at the history of anti-Semitism and how it's very dynamic and the character of it changes over time and context. So I really encourage people to get the book and read that to kind of understand um, yeah, it's unfolding over, over centuries. Um, but specifically for this conversation, I'd like to hear you both speak about um, how anti-Semitism functions now. And um, for instance, in the book you assert, and this is a quote, um, Anti-Semitism is a political project that reinforces structural inequalities in our white Christian hegemonic society and protects the most powerful. And um, there's also other things in the book, or I'll just speak for myself, that also um, um, conspiracy theories, as you touch on a lot, um, are um, often have a logic of anti-Semitism to them, which distract people from where actual power lies and how it actually operates. And so kind of mass power. Um, so can you can you explain more in depth um, how you understand anti-Semitism today and how it is interwoven um, mm -hmm. with things like Islamophobia, anti-Blackness and transphobia? Um, um, because I think as your book really rightly points out, um, anti-Semitism is a, a key pillar of upholding um, white Christian supremacy and what we might understand as fascism or Christo-fascism. So to undo that, we need to, in a sense, understand what, what it is and how it functions as an ism um, in, our, in our movements. Yeah, 
I mean, so we we talk about we use the concept of structural anti-Semitism, and I think that's a little bit different than some of the ways that anti-Semitism gets talked about. And the reason we talk about that is we kind of describe it as something that's been passed down through generations of basically Christian white European empire. And the narratives that were used to divert basically the anger of working people or the peasantry in years before away from the nobility and onto this sort of specter. And so obviously going back historically, when some Jews were brought into money lending or tax collecting because they were prevented from other industries, they became the face that many people sort of knew when it came to economic exploitation, even though they were not the folks in control of it. But these narratives evolved over time. They were once particularly religious, and they basically became secularized as we hit modernity. And then as people were reacting to the kind of alienations of modern capitalism and urbanity and kind of being moved out of maybe like uh, um, uh, villages and into cities, people were looking for answers. And so they turned back and sort of refashioned these. And people in power specifically pointed people in the direction of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories as a safety valve for their class anchor and to protect the powerful. And one of the things that's really important to know about anti-Semitic conspiracy theory is that it's not true. That's the fundamental core element of it, right? It's not actually a cabal of Jews controlling capital, it's capitalists. And that may seem like a fine distinction, but for over generations, we uh, there are populist conspiracy theories that direct people away from systems of power and onto these kind of figments or these individuals. And it tells a story about power that diverts people away from something you can actually do to change it. And so that ends up being an institution that protects power. And because it's so deeply laid in kind of the Western imagination, it survives over time and it refashions itself and it reimagines itself. But in doing so, because it has that sort of central piece of protecting power and being a narrative about power, it's used as pieces of all other kinds of bigoted movements, right? So it's a central piece of attacks on Black social movements, whereby Jews are basically said to be the people controlling them. Jews are said to be controlling uh, non-white or, or, or immigration from the global South, right? And so that's actually part of the narrative construct that people use. It's how they make sense of it, build a story about it, particularly most recently, that anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are used specifically on the attacks on youth gender medicine or on Drag Queen Story Hour or public LGBTQ events, right? These end up being an important element of it. And the reality is that that actually shows us how this works because it, it shows us very clearly that we have to build alliances, right? Because if we're both being targeted by basically white Christian supremacy, the far right, these institutions, and underlying it, capitalism and inequality itself, then obviously we're gonna have to partner with folks and build that community pressure, build that mass action so we can do something about it and also take it on at the root. Yeah, and like, one thing I think about like is like, you know, why now? You know, like like Shane said, you know, anti-Semitism, you know, has emerged in different times in different places. Um but I think, you know, the reason that we're talking about it so much today is because we're living in an era of prolonged crisis, right? You know, it's not a coincidence that um the rise of fascism in the 30s came after the Great Depression, right? And it's also no coincidence that by the same token the rise of nationalism and populism, not only in the US, but in, in Europe, in Brazil, in India, um, all over the world, has really came in the last decade and a half, you know, since the 2008 financial crash, cr crash since the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, we're living in, you know, a world, you know, of, of unprecedented you know, income inequality, you know, unprecedented, you know, you know, lack of, you know, undemocratic um, institutions, crisis of meaning, a widespread alienation. You know, basically, um, all these factors have emerged, you know, and throughout the modern era, as Shane was saying, anti-Semitism has served as a really convenient way for, for, for authoritarian movements and leaders to channel widespread alienation and to give people an explanation. You know, why uh, is government so unrepresentative? And there's a Jewish cabal you know, behind the scenes. Why um is the you know why is media why um you know is media such a, a conglomerate and um a monopoly? It's a Jewish cabal, right? Why is Wall Street rigged, right? So, you know, one thing that we come back to um in the book is that it's so um important then for us as leftists to really come and give people real explanations for why the world sucks and what we can do about it. Essentially, right? We we don't, you know, we don't point to, we we don't point to cabals, you know, behind, you know, Wall Street or behind the housing market, 
um, or behind a US um, imperialism. Instead, we'll, we look at structures and systems of oppression. Uh, and we show people the real uh, you know, economic and political power that combines um, and multiplies um, in our world to hold up systems of, of inequality. And most importantly, um, at our best, left social movements we give people an avenue to, to stand together um, and to fight back. So, you know, and, and the right knows this. So the right, especially in these moments of crisis, they use these conspiracy theories to say, hey, don't unite, don't develop an actual analysis of what's really going on. Instead, you know, chase this Jewish cabal um, over there. So, so time and again, it's a really effective tactic. And that's why we see uh, uh, Trump and the right going on and on about George Soros. That's why we see white nationalists uh, uh, shooting up, you know, um, you know, you know uh, synagogues and black churches and Latinx communities driven by these conspiracy theories, right? This stuff really percolates and grows um, in these moments of crisis. And so, um, you know, it's really important then for the left to offer our own kind of answer um, and program for why the world got so messed up and how we can fix it. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you both for that. Yeah. Um, you all had mentioned the, like naming, I really appreciate that naming the structures and naming the, the things we're facing right now instead of kind of, um, yeah, pointing to some, some secret power group behind the scenes, somehow pulling the strings and, um, I feel like uh, right now, I know the lot, a lot of um, the focus is, um, and it's been really powerful to watch a lot of um, um, a lot of people, but especially um, also Jews really like being side by side in the struggle to support um, um, Palestinians and want an end to the genocide. Um, and of course that has brought up um, folks talking a lot about what is happening in Gaza and in the state of Israel and um, looking to Zionism. But I also, because of the way your book speaks um, far more, you know, you know, even more, yeah, expansively about anti-Semitism, um, why we need to fight it because of how it interrelates to all these structures of power. Um, can you also speak to some of the way you see the relationship between fighting anti-Semitism to fighting fascism um, here where, where we live, those of us in um, the so-called United States or in North America? Um, and how we might draw from legacies of Jewish and non-Jewish anti-fascist organizing. Um, to my mind, the sort of rise of the Christo-fascism is, and Christian Zionism is inseparable from other forms of fascism and Zionism that are upholding um, the genocide in Gaza and other genocides and um, murderous policies here in, where, in, uh, in the United States as well. Um, yeah. yeah. So my long-winded question, how do you see the relationship between fighting fascism and fighting anti-Semitism? especially at this moment as we're heading into a time when, yeah, increasingly it's becoming clear um, fascism is taking hold um, in our part of the world. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, uh, you know, in the book we draw, we tell the story, for example, of how, of how Jewish communities um, in Charlottesville really, really banded together, right? Um, in the lead up to Unite the Right um, in 2017, which, you know, it's almost almost seven years ago now. Um, it's wild just, just yeah. how much, as you're saying, with the rise of fascism, how much the cries of Jews will not replace us in Charlottesville, the great replacement you know, uh, yeah, you know, conspiracies, the, the Christian supremacy, um, how much that's migrated from the so-called fringes to the heart of the GOP platform, right? Um, so we talk about these moments, like um, in the lead up to Charlottesville, you had radical Jewish leftists um, and you had progressive synagogues, you know, folks who might not have been fully down with uh, you know, anti-Zionism, uh, for example, but still knew how important it was to really throw down and counter fascists um, in the streets. You had all these groups really uniting with black non-Jewish groups, you know, Black Lives Matter groups, with Christian uh, progressives, with um, with Muslim groups, really uh, forming a multiracial um, and multi-faith coalition to really counter the fascists um, in the streets in Charlottesville at a time when uh, yeah, yeah, we actually um, interviewed people who told us very clearly uh, that the ADL um, in the lead up to Charlottesville actually was telling the Jewish community not to take the streets. The ADL was saying, just work with the cops instead. The cops will handle it. 
don't take the streets. It, 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 but a lot of the organizers knew that, no, you had to really, really counter these fascists where they showed up. You couldn't give them space. You could offer them like no quarter and you had to mount a response, right? So we draw on that history. And we also talk about how um, in the years since then, especially after the Pittsburgh synagogue sh shooting, a lot of progressive Jewish communities have been trying not to use police to defend our synagogues um, and our Jewish spaces, but instead to link up with um, other groups um, and to have community defense, right? In recognizing that the cops don't keep black Jews safe, cops don't keep you know any marginalized groups safe, especially when cops have always been you know part of fascism in the U.S. and even more today, right? Police uh, police departments are radicalizing um, ever further rightwards. So we know that we need to keep you know, each other safe and keep ourselves safe. I think that's one core lesson of our book is that these kind of this kind of grassroots um, anti-fascist defense is really key to keeping us all safe. Um, and with the rise of of crystal fascism, like you're saying, right, with um, attacks on drag queen story hour, attacks on on movement for Black Lives, um, attacks on um, all of our movements that might intensify in the coming months. I think those kind of lessons are more important than ever. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Shane, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I think like Ben's talking about, we take community self-defense really seriously as a component of Jewish safety. And, and one of the reasons that we kind of highlight it in that way is that it's actually different than what we're offered for Jewish safety. So on the one hand, us kind of uniting with our communities, not just ourselves, but other people that are affected by the far right, you know, like, for example, synagogue organizers partnering with mosques and creating like shared community defense plans mm -hmm. or other groups that have acknowledging those connections and building that safety is a different model than what people are given now, which is to basically partner with expert ship organizations, technocratic organizations and the police. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is to explicitly reject nationalism as a solution for Jewish safety. When we're offered Zionism and Israeli nationalism, particularly of the really virulent far right type that's just like moving, moving further to the right and openly justifying genocide, that we are sort of rejecting that as an actual model for Jewish safety. We know that nationalism has never kept Jews safe. And that's actually the historic Jewish experience and the historic Jewish leftist experience response to anti-Semitism, right? We know that nationalist movements generally uh, create these, these um, lineages that whereby Jews end up being forced out. And like we're seeing right now, the Israeli right partnering with the global fall right and all across Europe and even the United States movements that are explicitly anti-Semitic. Therefore, as they gain strength, they make Jews in the diaspora less safe. We know that that's not actually going to be a model that keeps any of us safe. And we, if we see those coalitions grow, we see Christian Zionists gain more power. That is a direct line to eroding Jewish safety. The alternative to that is anti-fascism, right? Is this mass movement against the far right that focuses on community safety and also helps to create the space to build larger community networks. You know, anti-fascism is what keeps mutual aid networks safe so they can build alliances and people can build those kind of meaning making that Ben was talking about. How do we sort of in these this moment of extreme climate and economic chaos, how do we build vibrant communities? Well, we need to protect them. And that's how anti-fascism historically been. And that's something that Jews a lot of the time have been really central pieces of. And we kind of talk a bit about that in the final chapters of the book. And so I think we really need to invest in that as what the future of Jewish safety is going to be. And I think as we're seeing, for example, a, a more openly anti-Semitic far right invoke Israel as their claim to Jewish safety, I think that's actually eroding people's confidence that Zionism actually has ever meant Jewish safety and not just imperialist ends in sort of with the support of Western imperial powers. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. That's really great bringing, bringing that connection of um, anti-nationalism into our anti-fascism and uh, maybe leads me to ask you to um, about, it. I've been thinking a lot about the sort of resurgence of a Jewish left um, as an anarchist, particularly Jewish anarchists have been uh, like real profound uh, reemergence of that, a, a long deep tradition, um, especially in, in, on this continent, but elsewhere, and also Jewish anti-Zionism and Jewish, you know, Jews that are looking for liberatory answers to things again, in a way. And that's long from my understanding as a Jew, been um, part of being a Jew for most of our centuries. We haven't had a state and for most of our centuries, but that it hasn't really been what most Jews have been seeking, different forms of community and liberation um, through 
structures of how we've understood different people, different Jews have understood um, their Jewishness or their Judaism. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an it's this moment where suddenly, in a way, coming back to as as you pointed out earlier, this kind of you know resurgence of of, of Jews sticking up for more of a liberatory world have kind of been raising um, raising concerns that Jews and and life ways that Jews have have often turned to in, instead of Zionism or states or you know colonialism or capitalism. Um, so I guess I guess what I what I want to ask you is what do you think is drawing people kind of back to their Jewish identity and back to this kind of liberatory politics through their Jewish identity, and uh, yeah, what do you think that looks like? including for yourselves, you know, how's, how's that, how's this time period felt? Cause it really does. I feel this been very, very poignant to, um, and, and necessary for myself to watch this kind of reflowering of, um, traditions of, um, a long tradition of Jews being anti-fascists and radicals and revolutionaries and standing up for a, a free world for everybody. It's really beautiful to see that as part of the struggle, um, including in solidarity with Palestinians, but in solidarity with people of, of all types, <laughs> which has often been how I've understand what a Jewish anarchist project is, is that no one is free until all of us are free. So, yeah. So what do you, what, what do you kind of make a why now? Why now many of us are returning to that as sort of a lens? I, yeah, I mean, this is an important question to me because in the process of writing this book was was sort of the peak process of me returning to Jewish ritual and tradition. And so that that's something that's on my mind. And and I think so as we, as you like you're mentioning, there's kind of the growth of people who are putting sort of like Jewish upfront and radical identities, whether it's a Jewish anarchist or, or part of explicitly Jewish kind of leftist organizations, a lot of which are Palestine solidarity organizations, some of which are, you know, pro-refugee groups and environmental groups. There's like a kind of a range. Um, but I think part of it is that people, and actually the left in general, now values ancestral traditions and alternative folkways as an actual challenge to power. And I don't know that that always had the same purchase with everyone, or they mm -hmm. came up in that environment where that was sort of honored in that way. I think also there's been enough space from people's Jewish history, whereby people sort of have more of a choice in how they approach it. And so I think it, when I talk to, sometimes I'll talk to, to friends who are older than me that were raised Orthodox, and they actually feel a little bit more nervous walking to a synagogue, you know, I mean, there's like uh, historical family stuff and baggage and stuff that comes along with it. And I have a very different relationship to it. And I think, so a lot of people are sort of doing this return of like reconstructing a Judaism that's meaningful. And now we also have the vantage point of being able to look at all the liberatory traditions and feel like we can take those and leave behind the stuff that doesn't serve us. And that's a really common process and stuff now. And so I think people like that. I think there's stuff specific to Jewish tradition also that speaks now. I can't think of anything that speaks to an era of COVID crisis and work crisis, environmental crisis more than Shabbos does. Like, like the ability to kind of turn off and to create these like sacred spaces, I think is incredibly meaningful to people and people want that stuff now. And so I think all of that ends up bringing that up. I think that's that necessarily has to be built around anti-Zionism because that's the set that is right now, I think the point of separation with sort of the American Jewish establishment. This is actually the point of rupture for a lot of young and radical Jews is it's going to be specifically along that. And so I think those are the lines that increasingly will separate that more and more. And so I think that ends up being like probably the, that will always be at least, you know, for the coming decades, I think the most pressing question for Jewish radicals and, and rebuilding how that imagination looks like, right? and then build, rebuilding this process of Jewish identity now away from Zionism, figuring out like what has Zionism done or what has Israeli nationalism done to change Jewish identity and then figuring out like what is meaningful without that or like, or detaching what was meaningful from that. So I think that project is sort of those things. I can say for me, and Ben, I think you'll probably answer this question differently. Like for me, like Jewish identity really is Jewish religious practice. And that comes because I wasn't raised in a big culturally Jewish space where this wasn't a big presence in my home. Really bringing that back in was about bringing Jewish ritual and tradition. And 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 part of that's bringing Jewishness in, part of that's just bringing spiritual life back into, which a lot of people are doing. I think um, I was talking with Dean Spade about this, who was basically saying that part of the reason is, is that these are really difficult times, right? Like these are times of economic and ecological collapse. People are asking really big questions and they want really big answers. And so people are searching for them. And so I think all of that ends up leading to this, that kind of process of 
of making kind of spiritual practice back part of a revolutionary tradition. So all that to say that I think people are moving along that trajectories and they're really finding something meaningful that they can latch on to. Um, and part of why I think religious tradition has become more a part of that than it was for the historic Jewish left is that Zionism has now occupied most of the space of Jewish secular life. And so uh, in a way, sort of like um, returning to Shabbos is sort of like the counterculture in a sense. So I don't know, Ben, how do you kind of like understand this, this shift in the Jewish left? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, totally. I resonate with a lot of what you're saying. You know, the, the religious versus secular, I, I mean, that's like a Christian opposition, right, to begin with, but um, Christian binary to, to begin with. But that whole debate, you know, Shane and I and many others have had that debate. I've been on, on all, you know, all different sides of it. I've had very you know, religious uh, phases of my Jewish journey and uh, phases that weren't so defined by uh, by practice. Um, but, you know, I mean, yeah, I was, when you were asking that, Cindy, and like, you know, when you were, you know, saying all that, Shane, I was, I was just thinking about just how I too am really amazed at the, at the resurgence right now. I remember, um, Back in 2011, when I was like a baby um, anti-Zionist, it just came back from the West Bank and saw the occupation firsthand. Um, yeah, it really felt like yeah, those of us who were speaking out in the American Jewish community were like a voice in the wilderness. Uh, I remember as I was leaving the West Bank being like, are there any Jews back home in America who, uh, who agree with me? Um, and I found a JVP video um, on YouTube and I was like, thank God there are a few you know, and there were you know, a few of us. And then I remember, you know, like when the um, often, uh, sadly, horrifically enough, I feel like there's always, you know, upsurges um, in the Jewish left during and after, you know, Israeli attacks on Gaza. And I remember it, after, the, you know, the, the 2014 attack on Gaza, a JVP grew by leaps and bounds. And so many of the friends I made um, on the Jewish left from that time period who we all were radicalizing and we were all, um, building a Jewish um, anti-Zionist movement. And I feel like it's, there have been waves, right? Then, if not now, in, in 2016. And so I feel like, yeah, it's very new what's been happening since October 7th with the with the rise of strong, vibrant Jewish left communities. And it's also very not new. It's, we're, we're all, you know, on the shoulders of those who came before. And in the book, uh, uh, Shane and I uh, talk about yeah, groups like uh, the Chutzpah um, or the Brooklyn Bridge Collective in the 80s and 90s, a new Jewish agenda um, who really were uh, were articulating a Jewish left politics. So the new left in the 60s was very Jewish. Um, even before that, uh, as you both know well, right, the early 20th century, the Jewish anarchist and socialist and communist uh, movements um, all around the world. Um, it's really like, yeah, the Jewish left is a long you know, tradition that's had had secular components um, and religious components. And um, yeah, I, I almost feel like uh, Zionism is what's yeah, you know abnormal, right? This this 30 or 40 year consensus of, of Zionism being dominant in the American in Jewish community is what's abnormal. I, I also think that like, you know, um, some American Jewish class positions are changing right now, right? You know, like a lot of like my millennial generation, a lot of us are down with mobile. Um, those of us who, who even did grow up in middle class homes, which is like some of us, but certainly not all of us. Um, and I think the answer of why the Jewish left is rising is also the answer of why the left is rising in general. And uh, millions of Americans are like, "Hey, capitalism is not working. You know, we live in a, a racist, yeah, you know, country. Um, our climate is collapsing. We need something radically different." And so I think, um, yeah, it's really it's a it's what a time to be alive and to be having these conversations and be building these movements. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank. You. There are so many, so many, so many rates. There is no one reason why, but it also feels really remarkable. This kind of uh, moment of resurgence, and um, yeah, I was thinking about when both of you were speaking that kind of um, where everything's sort of falling apart. This also kind of resurgence of a lot of us who are Jewish wanting to unassimilate from um, the world around us, which is bringing us back to all sorts of um, traditions and ideas and um, histories. Um, that, um, you know, were stolen from us by colonialism and capitalism and states. So I'm finding that really powerful, the way yeah. people are kind of returning back to um, 
to those traditions, but then making them their own or querying them. There's a, whole, a huge, huge upsurgence of kind of queer and trans Jews right now too, which has really um, been striking. And um, yeah, and uh, I've also really been appreciating, I was hanging out today with uh, some other Jewish radicals and they were talking about how at the encampments, the real power, which both of you touched on about being able to bring those rituals like um, liberation Shabbats into um, liberated zones of the encampments and um, do ritual practices in the middle of a direct action, um, including with um, Muslims and other people doing ritual practices um, separately and together. And so this kind of way through through ritual and sacred space, I, I, I was thinking a lot about that, of the kind of um, resurgence coming by, it creates space for all of us to kind of re remember what's sacred again and across across our different, um, yeah, ways of looking looking at the world or feeling the world in terms of our, our own traditions and cultures. Yeah. Um, and yet still, I wanna ask you this question. I still find that including in radical spaces of all types, progressive, leftist, anarchist, socialist, et cetera, um, it feels like us Jewish radicals are frequently the ones that have to sort of take the lead or do the work to fight anti-Semitism or even often kind of at a minimum, even to get non-Jewish comrades to even understand anti-Semitism, believe it, uh, name it, maybe not fall into sort of um, unintentional logics of anti-Semitic thinking, which I found um, disturbingly prevalent oftentimes, um, especially since October, it seems like it's kind of been re-emerging in, in among, among people who I would understand to be comrades usually, and to also fight alongside um, us um, against anti-Semitism as we fight against all other isms. Um, yeah, especially again, because um, thinking through anti-Semitism is as yet one of the pillars of upholding white Christian supremacy and fascism that it has to be fought, not just by Jews, but by all of us in the same way as we touched on earlier, you know, other other isms need to be fought, um, whether colonialism and capitalism or um, anti-blackness or Islamophobia, et cetera, um, need to be fought together um, by all of us who desire a liberatory world. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I want to just come, you're thinking on why does it still seem, which has felt kind of exhausting, I think, especially since October 7th, when there is more visibility of people talking about anti-Semitism, yet it, it still feels like it falls to your book or to those of us who are Jewish to take it seriously and, and do the explaining of it. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think accounts for that, I guess? Yeah, that's, that's so real, Cindy. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, um, you know, we say in the book, like, you know, obviously Jews can't put anti-Semitism alone. It's a problem of the non-Jewish world. Uh, fundamentally, and we need everyone in that fight. And it's, you know, it's, there's, you know, everyone on this call, I'm sure, you know, who cares about this issue knows that um, it is a common experience to, um, if you do a workshop on anti-Semitism um, in a leftist space and you look around and you, you, you ask, you know, like who in this room is not Jewish? Um, often it's a minority of people who are raising their hands. Often it's, you know, usually Jews in those uh, spaces. Uh, and it leads to um, some real feelings of isolation. Um, in the last book event I did, someone asked a question, um, you know, like, um, how can we, what, you know, how can we know that non-Jews really want to stand with us, right? Um, what examples are there of non-Jews standing with us? And so this uh, this feeling of, of isolation can be really real. Um, and I think like, you know, something that yeah, someone said to us during the interviews, which made it um, in the book, is that, you know, they made a comparison to uh, when queer folks first started taking on the project um, in the 60s, um, in the 70s, of, of really educating um, other leftists about their, you know, their are um, oppression and really just saying, hey, we have to take this seriously. People don't necessarily want to listen at first. Same with you know, the first moves to fight patriarchy um, on the left. There's, you know, every group has encountered resistance. Every group has encountered uh, uh, disbelief or gaslighting. Um, because the project of getting people to unlearn their inherited um, oppressive attitudes is um, inevitably uh, like hard, right? Um, uh, but it takes a solid committed core of people, often from the oppressed group, who start to theorize, hey, here's what this oppression looks like. Here's how it works, and who start to you know, build the language and build the vocabulary and build the momentum to to educate their comrades. And I think we are seeing that, uh, yeah, you know, underway. Um, 
And it's at a moment when, yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. as you're saying, um, anti-Semitism um, is on the left, um, as is every other kind of oppression, right? Because it's it's in the air we breathe. It's in our white Christian hegemonic society. So of course it's going to replicate itself on the left until we do something about it. Um, it shows up in conspiracy theories. Um, it shows up in microaggressions. It shows up in the way people can, can talk about um, uh, you know, finance capitalism or can talk about Zionism, right? Um, if you're talking about Zionism as a conspiracy, if you're saying that that Zionists control the government or control the media. Um, you know, that is basically, um, instead of having like a structural analysis of US empire, you're using an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And we can go into that more, but like, so those are only two examples, but yeah, it's real on the left and we need to to fight it and take it seriously. And we need more non-Jews. Um, and there, um, I have been heartened by uh, a lot of non-Jewish comrades and allies who do care about this from their own perspective of liberation, but uh, but we need more of them. Um, Shane, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I think all of what Ben, you know, what Ben was talking about is totally real. I think there's also this unique situation in which there's like a giant political and social infrastructure to basically make anti-Semitic anti-Semitism allegations specifically against like social movements of color or folks fighting for Palestinian liberation. So people are sort of cynical about the conversation. And because of that, I think that's part of why the left probably receded from that conversation. And then once you've receded from it, you sort of cede the ground to someone else and it's harder to re-enter that space a bit. So I think it becomes a situation in which folks are actually really hesitant to get into that conversation uh, because of the way it's just overwhelmingly mobilized politically. I think that's a piece of it. I think another piece of it is that is some of the particularities of anti-Semitism, it presents itself as a challenge to power. We're actually, we're fighting the cabal, we're fighting those in power. And I think as people build mass movements, sometimes there's a hesitance to sort of, um, create barriers to entry to say like, oh, well, that maybe, maybe that's not the right analysis. I think folks sometimes want to have a more broad populist language because like in the end, hey, we're all fighting those in power, aren't we? Isn't that kind of useful? And I think what we haven't brought back enough um, is like what it actually, how that actually affects us when folks come in with bigoted ideas, even if they're joining the coalition, how does it come in? How can it destroy movements? How can I actually help the far right in those situations? I think sharing that. You know, when I was, I was working on the book, I was thinking a lot about, you know, a point that a friend of mine, Mike Crenshaw, had made when we were organizing many years ago, which was that, like, you, he's like, you shouldn't be afraid of speaking to people's self-interest. You should talk to them about why something that doesn't seem like it affects them affects them. That's important. And, you know, as I talked, I did interviews with folks when we were doing the book, people had uneven feelings about that, about whether or not it should be presented that way, whether or not their safety should be presented in a way for somebody else. And I think there's real about that. But I also think the reality is that anti-Semitism is a motivating factor in the far right. It holds together broad conspiracy theories and mobilizes all kinds of bigoted ideas. And so people should understand it as that they need to be invested in, in destroying that because they're invested in their own liberation, right? It's a collective liberation project. And like Ben said, oftentimes folks who are like, you know, uh, of an identity need to speak out on that. And that just happens to be the case. But I'm also finding that like that has started to change somewhat, probably part of because of the growth of anti-fascism and people are very clear about how anti-Semitism works in white nationalism. So people are kind of joining that. I think there's also a certain amount of like, because populism was so important to the right the last few years people want to differentiate a little bit and they want to talk about like no no no. what are we talking about here are we talking about you know the rich are we talking about the state are we talking about class struggle here and so some people i think also want to clarify a bit and define this and that in a way is sort of an attack on anti-semitism because it's actually making very clear who's in charge and how we're going to fight them so there are some shifts that happen with that but obviously like been saying we have a distance to go before it like really there's like a vibrant consensus understanding of what anti-semitism is and what we can do about it yeah yeah okay i'm um I, I think I may ask you one other question. And in the meantime, if any of the folks want to put questions in the Q&A and then Liberty will read off um, some after this this last sort of question. Um, and so now's a good time to type in questions if you have them. Um, I know you kind of touched on this earlier, but um, solidarity is like a big part of the title of the book, <laughs> Safety Through Solidarity. And um, I kind of want to focus on that word solidarity, which um, 
to me feels like one of the most profound practices at this particular moment in human history um, when there's just you know so much um, yeah brutality that just seems so clearly wrong in the world like people sticking side by side with each other um, on the right you know the right side of being against um, something just that seems so self-evidently awful a genocide for instance um so yeah solidarity seems a, a really huge thing in a, in a world that's kind of abandoning so many of us um and I was wondering on the one hand you could talk about like what are some misguided understandings of solidarity but I'd love to hear you speak a little bit more about kind of what your visions for really substantive forms of solidarity would look like um moving toward a world without relying on police or um, a, a world in which we have solidarity across spiritual and social spaces, um, mm -hmm. a world, yeah, in which we're really kind of walking side by side with each other in our prefigurative practices. Um, yeah, I, maybe some examples that you've heard of, or maybe some examples that you dream of <laughs> that you would want solidarity to look like going forward. Um, I was just um, reading a story of someone who just um, been um, spent a few months with a uh, the um, international solidarity movement and in, um, in the West Bank and them just talking about having done that before and how it just totally transformed their life to be in a situation where everyone's facing peril together and hardship and also being there for each other through, you know, the joys and sorrows of life um, and living daily life with each other. That really struck me. They were talking about when they went over there, just the amount of time in people's homes with people for months on end where you're experiencing the fullness of life with someone as a deep form of solidarity um, that's not mediated by, you know, police and states and nonprofits and all these other things. So, yeah, I would just, and, and, you know, we can't, we, not everyone is going to want to do that kind of solidarity, but yeah. What do you, what do you, yeah. What, what would you, I guess, look, I'm just rambling now, like kind of think through what you really meant by solidarity and what you'd like to see when you yeah. use that as a title. Yeah, I think one of it is just an acknowledgement of the reality, which is that Jewish safety actually depends on the safety of other people. And so like part of sort of operating from a place of privilege is the illusion that this actually will keep you safe, that like, for example, an aggressive Israeli nationalism, a further right shifting nationalism, support of this kind of militarized state, the colonial state is actually connected to your safety, which is a falsehood in the end, right? And it's also in borrowed time in a degree. The same thing that depending on rich donors or kind of like uh, investment from police to give disproportionate protection to different communities, all of that ends up sort of as an illusion that doesn't get us to the kind of long-term dependable safety that people want. Because I think a lot of this, and we talk about this in the book, comes from historic trauma, comes from uh, kind of legacies of trauma and real experience of violence where people aren't really willing to operate from the pace, place of faith that solidarity requires of like, okay, if I really invest in my neighbors who have lines of difference, they're different than me in certain ways, how do you build that connection? And so I think when we're talking about that, we wanna look at like, what is gonna make, what can we do to create safety that uses all of us together, that basically has our strategic element on all those relationships. So like Ben sort of was talking about, and I had mentioned, we talked about, we talked with folks who created the Clergy Collective in Charlottesville, which was a coalition of the synagogue and historically Black churches who had just been mobilizing for defense after the Dylan Roof shooting. So they kind of had seen that very clear. And there was a sort of um, precedent before uh, the Unite the Right rally, because there had been a Klan rally, there had been a number of incidents. And so they were mobilizing together, creating relationships so that they create that safety network, right? And that was fundamentally different because they were coming out oftentimes and protesting and being in physical space at a time when the largest anti-anti-Semitism organization, the ADL, was telling them to go home, right? And saying like, the, your safety depends on you removing yourself from the situation, not marching in coalition with the Black churches, going home. And so it was specifically, that was actually how they had blocked that. And I think that in a way, that's a great model. We talked with organizers from Surge showing up for racial justice, and they had done a lot of safety trainings, both for the High Holy Days and for a number of other holidays and had coordinated people of different traditions. So hopefully when someone, um, it's not a holiday for them, it's a holiday for someone else, they can show up and they create those permanent networks. And this is something that has historically been done in Jewish spaces oftentimes, but it hasn't become the large legacy because it doesn't, you know, fund large security companies. It doesn't create like, you know, kind of allegiances with right-wing politicians. There's a lot of options like that. But I think when we think about it that way, we have to start asking the questions about what comes next. Because the real question then is how do you create a revolutionary movement that changes 
the entire nature of the society. So this is a vastly unsafe world to live in, right? Yeah, yeah. And so if we have these common sort of enemies in folks that are, you know, hyper exploiting the planet, they're creating these systems and using populist conspiracy theories to divide working people, then the reality is, is that we're going to have to band together, mutual aid, solidarity, direct action, and actually take that on. And so I think in a way, when we think about safety through solidarity, we think about what are the immediate things we can do? And then how is that a stepping stone to building a sort of mass movement that can change the underlying mechanisms here? Because one of the things that we talk about in the book is we are not pessimistic or fatalistic about this. Like we actually think that we can do things about this. You think this is changeable, you know? One of the narratives that we get from a lot of anti-antisemitism organizations is that there's fundamentally nothing you can do about anti-Semitism. They might not say it this way, but it almost implies that there's something kind of broken in the Gentile mind that will never be able to be healed, right? And so we can only defend it. We can never eradicate it. But we are revolutionaries, right? We talk about eradicating threat. We talk about remaking the world. And so I think we think about it in that way. And actually, to get back to one of the questions a couple ago, that's in a way how Jewish tradition has often told that story about the, the kind of work we do to heal the world and what it looks like for a world to be something in the future. What, what could we expect? What would be a more perfect world look like? So we don't abandon that project, right? We take that project on and we can only do that with all of us. So I think it ends up being, and this is true of kind of all revolutionary movements, what can we do together now? And how does that build to what we can do together later? Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 I mean, we definitely tell a lot of stories in the book of, for example, like, you know, of the, um, of, you know, the Arab Jewish caucus um, of Jewish racial and economic justice, um, leading the, the rest of the Jews uh, in that organization to, you know, to go stand um, at, you know, at JFK airport uh, during Trump's Muslim ban wow. because of the deep relationships they had built with Muslim organizations um, in New York, also with you know, Arab American um, orgs in New York, of which they, as Arab Jews, were members, right? Um, because they, you know, like like all of us in different ways, um, hold overlapping you know, and mutual, you know, identities, right? Um, and then how those relationships of struggle during the Muslim ban were deepened such that um, a, a year later, after the Pittsburgh uh, synagogue shooting, you, you had Muslims, uh, Muslim groups and 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 Arab American groups um, showing up for JFRED, showing up at Jewish communities and saying, you know, how can we help? How can we defend your spaces, right? Um, and that might sound transactional on the surface, but it's really built off this web of like overlapping relationships that are that are deepened through struggle, right? And are prefigurative. It's showing up and defending each other and modeling the world that we want to build. Um, so we tell a lot of stories uh, like that. We also, you know, um, go in depth and talk to this group, Never Again Action, right? Um, a group of, of Jews who are fighting for migrant justice and who really deeply believe that, that when they show up on the front lines to shut down an ICE station, they're doing it, first of all, uh, some of them might be um, the immigrant Jews themselves, some might be, be Latinx Jews who are directly impacted by anti-immigrant xenophobia, regardless of their um, immigration status. But they also know that, that anti-immigrant xenophobia um, is tied into anti-Semitism and the same infrastructure is putting Jews in danger, right? These conspiracy theories of George Soros as the architect behind um, immigration is putting Jews in danger um, and migrants in danger. At, and so we have to lift those kinds of stories. And, you know, but, you know, often like when people are talking about, you know, solidarity to, today, often uh, when Jews ask these kinds of questions, it's because it often feels hard, I mean, especially since October 7th, like you're saying, Cindy, our relationships have been tested um, on the left, sometimes with our non-Jewish comrades, feeling like um, anti-Semitism has gone um, unaddressed or even, for Jews who are still wrestling with Zionism in various ways, feeling like the, the, they don't have allies in progressive movements. Um, and we interview someone in the book named Dove Kent, a Jewish movement leader who says, solidarity isn't easy. It's trying, it's, it's failing sometimes, it's struggling, but it's reaching for each other over and over again. Um, it's not giving up, you know, it's still coming back to the table, even when it's hard. Um, and that really uh, inspired me and I said that at the last talk we gave and afterwards someone came up to me and said, yeah, sure, solidarity is hard, but also solidarity is 
you know, it's not easy. You just show up, you know? And I I try to hold, you know, both in my hand. I like that, that, um, that, uh, that quote from Pirkei Avo, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish text about uh, uh, how you hold two sayings, uh, one in each, each, um, each pocket. I won't go into it, but basically in one pocket, I try to hold solidarity is hard. It's, it's difficult. It's, it's challenging. There, there are bumps on the road. Um, and, and, and the other pocket I try to hold solidarity is easy. You, you, you just have to show up, you know? Oh, thank you too. That was, that was beautiful. <laughs> what you both said. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Liberty and hope there's some questions in the chat, which I haven't looked at, so. Um. There are, yeah, we have some some good Q&A topics um, and I hope folks who are in the audience will uh, give us a couple more. Um, so just to pull one right off the top here, um, there's a question about um, kind of the book and uh, whether or not y'all touch on the relationship between Ashka normativity and the work of combating anti-Semitism. Um, and Rebecca says, I've been trying to think through how to both decenter Ashka normativity while still taking seriously the history and now very present growth of anti-Semitism across Europe specifically. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. That's a really good question. I think we definitely do talk about that. Um, and it's something that I've had to learn over the years and that, that many of us who, um, who are Ashkenazi and, and many who aren't, yeah, you know, have to unlearn these things because, because so often the model of Jewishness that we're taught, you know, growing up does uh, does you know, it's like a it's like fiddler on the roof, you know, it's like censors the the pogroms, it censors the East European shadow, and it censors this story that is very Europe specific that that anti-Semitism is is permanent is. It's unchanging. It's always going to be with us. Uh, it's cyclical. Comes back over and over again, and we can essentially like, like never eradicate it. Um, and I think one way to decenter that kind of story of Jewish history, which helps to underline so much of Zionism, is to look at the histories of Jews who often thrived for centuries um, in non-Christian lands across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, um, and around the world, you know, obviously there was also um, anti-Semitism there. There was second class status there. You don't want to paint an overly rosy picture, but it's very true that often the way that Jews lived um, in Muslim majority countries for centuries and for millennia um, even had a lot more coexistence, uh, you know, a lot more of what you might call a multiculturalism, a lot more of cross communal thriving and um, you know the, the the golden era of Muslim Spain, for example. You know before the Christians conquered it um, and kicked all the Jews and Muslims out in 1492, um, or the 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 the, the, the two thousand year history of, of Jews in places like um, Iraq, where there's often a lot of thriving, and that's kind of the cradle of Jewish civilization and and history and text in a lot of ways. And so looking at those narratives can help to decenter this this uh, story that all of Jewish history is just like, you know, pogrom to pogrom for 2000 years until we got Israel. Um, but yeah, Shane, I wonder what you think about that too. Yeah, it ended up being a really big part of the book and how we thought through the book and what we wanted to be different about what we were writing than what was out there. And, you know, part of when we're working on the book, part of going doing through the book was like really taking a sharp look at like what kind of writing do people do on this subject? Like what kind of scholarship exists? What kind of research? And when you find over and over and over again, and this in a way is part of sort of like Zionist historiography is basically projecting Ashkenazi experiences onto non Ashkenazi Jews or using the language of Ashkenazi experiences, using bits of their story. And so then retelling the story of, for example, Arab Jews or Mizrahi Jews, and then telling it through like the language of Ashkenazi experiences, which totally erases not just their traditions and cultures, but also oppression, right? And so you end up with a really bad vantage point on how these things work. And we talk about, particularly as we like we have more diverse Jewish communities, people having like complicated identities and experiencing anti-Semitism in really interesting ways and having lessons to teach everybody else about that and having basically 
um, having those experiences be instructive for how we're actually building those projects going forward. So for example, we talked with uh, Black Orthodox leaders that have been creating programs like this and having to challenge their synagogue's response to anti-Semitism by turning to the police and saying, actually, police are not going to keep you as safe as you think. We have experiences with this that can basically open up. And then that was actually a way of sort of like expanding their vision of how to fight anti-Semitism. And when you center Jews and mixed experience or diverse experiences, Ashkenazi and non-Ashkenazi, then you're able to really start to understand how to build a really strong program, I think. Um, this is something though, particularly in the US, like there's just a lot of way to go on this. Um, and we talked with a lot of folks that talked about, like, again, feeling like basically cut out of Ashkenazic centric Jewish organizations and having not just their Jewish experiences not reflected there, but not having their experiences of anti-Semitism taken seriously or found like allies there. And I think this is, again, going to be the pressing question as we have a more diverse uh, Jewish community, as there's more converts, as there's more people of like mixed parentage and mixed bathroom or multi-faith families, that kind of thing. More diverse experiences have to instruct how we take on anti-Semitism or we're simply not taking on anti-Semitism. And I, so I think that ends up being about if we're talking about safety through solidarity, having those experiences sort of lead how you build programs, and how you think about it is important for actually having the safety mechanisms we're talking about here. Thanks, y'all. That was a great prompt and good responses. Um, maybe uh, one that I'm excited about, I always love when people bring up youth liberation. We've got someone who's asking about how the dynamics um, that we've been discussing show up in the education system and also what it might mean for youth and teens to resist, uh, resist anti-Semitism in a way that's also inherently anti-ageist. Any thoughts on that? That's a really good question. Um, that's a really interesting question. So I think on the one hand, the way that like sort of like counter radicalization discourse happens now is like a very kind of deeply ageist rhetoric because it assumes that sort of like young people don't have agency and that they can't sort of like make smart decisions. And there's a, an incredible amount of paternalism about it, like particularly if like, you know, online radicalization discourse or like targeting like things that are like kind of coded as being young, like video games. And so I think like having basically engaging communities as partners is the way that you go around that of like talking with folks that are like in school or younger and like having actual relationships about that. But I think also that's the place in which folks can basically divert conversations that can go in conspiracy theory directions or anti-Semitic directions and have like real conversations about power and organizing. Because I think inside like a school setting in a lot of ways those that can be like a, these powerful moments where people come together and are facing like kind of like real problems right up front and able to build kind of social movements i mean that's in a lot of ways like a school is where i came to consciousness on those things right and where i talked to folks and where i formed like who i was and it was because people invested in me and like treated me like a peer so i think in a way like we've sort of like abandoned organizing with young people almost entirely and feel like unless folks are like in their 20s we can't have a conversation with them which is just this absurd thing and again it's part of this sort of what we've called sometimes counter vi countering violent extremism this very like sort of um professionalized pro-police way of dealing with the far right dealing with conspiracy theories that doesn't actually engage in organized communities and doesn't actually value people as they're making changes or growing over time you know ben what do you think about this yeah. No, totally. Like, I think I have the same, it's a really good question. And I think yeah. I'm in the same uh, place. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 35. And so I feel really hesitant to avoid ageism and to be like, here's how younger people should play into you know, but, um, but, you know, it, I, and I've been in this, you know, get a relationship to, uh, you know, organizers who are a lot younger than myself for a while. Um, I used to work as JDP's campus um, organizer. So like, I wrestled a lot with like, as someone in my late twenties, when I'm, you know, how do I support 18, 19, 20 year olds, you know, undergrads and leading their own movement. Um, so yeah, you know, but also um, in my work today, researching the far right, I end up looking a lot at Gen Z white nationalist movements, like the, uh, you know, the Groyper movement, I love by Nick Fuentes, where it's often like, you know, college kids or even like, you know, 15, 16 year olds, um, high school students, um, even middle school students who, you know, are tuning in. Um, 
And I know there's many studies, like Shane said, these studies do definitely feel like the kind of de radicalization biases, but there are many studies showing that you know, a rise in conspiracy thinking among um, a Gen Z, you know, folks, right? Um, with, you know, you know, um, and, and conspiracy theories on TikTok and misinformation. Um, and also looking at the post-October 7th, some of the most inspiring organizing obviously has happened on college campuses. And not only that, in high schools and even uh, middle schools, I mean, high school walkouts um, that are like really inspiring a mass movement that we haven't seen since the Iraq war. Um, so yeah, I don't have any good answers, but I feel like just, I have a lot of, uh, of trust in folks who are younger than myself uh, that there's a lot of energy to change the world. Um, and I hope so, because otherwise we're kind of fucked. So um, yeah, um, Cindy, also, if you have any thoughts about any of this, uh, you're totally, I'd love to hear Oh, you. yeah. No, I was thinking I when you two did um, a conversation about this book um, with Jewish Currents, I, the, one of the last questions that have really been stuck with me was someone who was asking you about how to, you know, what kind of materials are available for um, young folks um, to educate them on, um, you know, everything, but but in, specifically anti-Semitism. And it really struck me when you two were saying, well, you know, unfortunately, the kind of, um, you know, uh, pro pro state of Israel and pro Zionism folks have often put out, you know, have the have often put out most of the materials that get into schools for younger folks. So maybe just thinking about like, you know, the the need for um, a bunch of um, anyone who's radical to think about, um, you know, educational materials that are accessible to all different ages um, and including younger folks writing that material, you know, and um, countering that in um, places where where this worth worth you know we think about things that in, in sometimes you know i don't know some of our thinking becomes very formative in you know middle school high school etc how, how we're kind of taught to cr think critically and what we're exposed to so yeah but that really stuck with me um hmm. so maybe my answer is more materials for um including written by youth <laughs> um for youth to think about these questions um i know you talk maybe about your book maybe some of it being turned into some kind of like critical reading guide or something, but yeah, that might be a, a... Yeah, yeah, and we actually, um, we're working with with Margaret Kiljoy to make a zine, which I think will be out uh, nice. soon. Be like a nice, like kind of easy thing. You know, one thing that I actually am kind of thinking of too, is that, you know, and, and Ben sort Ben talked about this a bit too earlier of like, you know, a lot of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories come from like real situations of hopelessness and angst or actually finding a pathway to actually confronting issues. And I think particularly when it comes to young people, people simply don't listen to what people are actually saying and letting that drive what solutions happening and letting there be like youth led social movements to address like youth conditions. And I think that in a lot of ways is what's important here. If there are like organizers out there basically like talking down saying, this is what you need. You need this version of education reform. You need this version of labor stuff, whatever it is that actually doesn't speak to people's conditions and I feel like that just further entrenches people's like alienation from like what are we actually going to do about this so I, and I and I sort of think in a certain way it's a similar answer to a lot of other questions when it comes to organizing with young folks of like actually listen to young folks and let them take the lead you know yep yep thanks y'all um another another question here um yeah this one about the kind of attempted co-optation of Palestinian solidarity by certain like authoritarian and vanguard organizations. Um, Autumn specifically mentions PSL and wondering if y'all have thoughts on how that um, may have contributed uh, to anti-Semitism. Oh man, that's a really good question. I want to, <laughs> I don't really want to, you know, um, you know, directly intervene in the many factional debates happening in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Especially. This is the left. That's what we're here I, for. I know. <laughs> the thing I might go up on YouTube, I don't necessarily want to be like, yes, these orgs are X, Y, Z. But I guess I will say that, like, yeah, you know, I think um, 
I think that there, you know, um, in the book, we talk about you know, a thing called campism, which is kind of the, you know, a theory that I learned in the midst of researching this book. It was a thing that like, oh, yes, I've seen this so much on the left, and now I have a word to describe it. So campism is basically this um, this tendency to just support whatever the opposing camp is. The, the idea is like the enemy of the enemy um, is my friend, right? And so... The the, the the tendency to uncritically support um, any and all resistance movement or any and all uh, nationalist or authoritarian you know regime in the world just because it's opposed to, to U.S. empire um, or just because it's opposed obviously to um, Israel's genocide and apartheid you know um, to uncritically support the organization without really you know analyzing its 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 uh, its ideology without really su uh, uh, supporting is this is this um, organization devoted to a liberatory principles, or is it is it replicating, um, I, you know, theocratic nationalism, or, um, or uh, you know, or male supremacy, or or anti semitism, or you know, or, or any of the other oppressive systems? Is it really an anti capitalist um, organization? Um, often not. So I think yeah, there is this tendency to. to, to to kind of um, uncritically support the access of, of resistance against um, Israel's genocide, um, that that um, in a way means that you do end up just flying the flag of of of, of anti-Semitic resistance uh, movements, rather than having a more nuanced approach of like resistance is justified when people are occupied, obviously, but we also have the autonomy and the ability to also uh, maintain our critical. Yeah thinking and to analyze the, 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 the balance of forces and, and to analyze uh, different kinds of resistance uh, movements and so to not just kind of uh, uncritically uh, fly the flag of whatever uh, group is um, is opposing um, Israel's genocide, I guess. Yeah, Shane, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm glad you asked the t answer the tough yeah. question and I could go a second. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's I think I, I largely have a, a similar feeling. And I think when we're talking about some of these groups, um, it's also sort of bad politics when it came to Ukraine or bad politics, you know, in defense of Assad or sort of de facto support for Putin. Um, I, and I think like in general, it comes from that sort of like white bed described that campus position instead having a more like kind of holistic liberatory position about what this kind of like global revolution look like and what does it look like to have like these alliances between oppressed folks across like different geographies that's a more tough complicated one because it's not actually going to give you a clear answer in any individual political moment which is why like for example moving past just some of these organizations but having connections with folks on the ground hearing folks building community building relationships like that that's really really important and i think in all honesty while some of those groups have been the loudest a lot of these protests, that is not the bulk of like any of these movements. And it's definitely not the bulk of the Palestine solidarity movement. And I think most people, for example, are having a lot of conversations about what does it look like to have a liberatory future in historic Palestine for everyone that lives there from the river to the sea. That kind of conversation, I think, is actually really vibrant and exciting. And one of the ways we sort of <laughs> marginalize like the kind of bad voices on this is being really upfront about like what we actually, what like what our support means, like what does it mean we're engaging in organizing, what our stake in it is, and what kind of vision for the future we have. Um, and sort of refusing sort of reactionary buyout uh, when it's kind of offered like as, a, as an easy package for resistance. Cindy, you got anything on that that you want to? Uh, those were yeah. both really good answers. <laughs> Great. Yeah. They were. Yeah. They were. Okay. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, and I think this is also a, a, a good one. Um, uh, so someone in attendance has um, said, you know, I'm a Christian. Um, and, you know, obviously we've been talking about the way in which uh, Christianity has contributed to anti Semitism, um, uh, both in the present and historically. Uh, and so this person is asking uh, if there's um, a recommendation uh, for places to learn more about that uh, kind of um, historic uh, and ongoing contribution to anti-Semitism from kind of the Christian world. Um, do you all have any, any, anything to point this person towards that you think is particularly uh, useful? 
Well, we have a chapter in our book on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we we actually we talk about it super really extensively in the book and there's a number of authors that we like that have talked about this history and we trace it back to some kind of early theological interventions um both in the gospels and the book of acts and then later um uh, in, in commentary on those that particularly put a kind of division between jews and christians about who is sort of like the properly spiritual people and who is sort of um overly carnal and clannish and conspiratorial and then obviously that evolved over time so we we go through that a bit in the book i i will say that this is complicated stuff and it runs really deep and we also had a lot of conversations about the fact that a lot of Christians have rejected that or are working their way out of that. And that there's not, and I think because of the, the position of Christianity in Europe and because of the imperial history of Europe, we're talking about the effects of imperial Christianity more than we're talking about other things. But a lot of folks like have like religious baggage or tradition or pieces of their tradition that have had kind of the seeds of oppression too. And so I think I'm, I, one of the things is that we interviewed a number of Christian leaders that kind of reckon with that and try and build with that and then build alliances with other folks. I don't know, Ben, if you had any specific recommendations you thought were good. Yeah, totally. Yeah. One book that really was helpful to me that I think um, people often look to as the Bible, no pun intended, of this stuff is um, a book by uh, Paul Kibble called Living in the Shadow of the Cross. And um, he's a Bay Area uh, radical who, and living in, his book, Living in the Shadow of the Cross is, is kind of like a one-on-one on different ways of how Christian hegemony uh, manifests and, and impacts um, our culture, our attitudes, um, our politics, the way we think about our bodies, our souls, um, you know, ourselves, you know. Um, so that's really good. There's also, um, we interview um, in the book this um uh this pastor named named Reverend um Anne Dunlap who has a really good podcast called The Word is Resistance and she used to lead faith work in showing up for racial justice. She's she's done a lot of, of good work around uh, Christian anti-Semitism and Christian Christian dominance. Um so yeah uh, and then there's a good organ named Soul Force. Soul Force does a lot of work on Christian supremacy. Um, it's led by Christians by radical Christians and people raised Christian. Uh, so yeah, those are three three places um, I've learned a lot. Um, and yeah, I'm really glad you're here. And um, yeah, we all have to unlearn this stuff. Um, you know, those of us who are Christian, raised Christian and those who aren't, so yeah. Well, y'all, this has been an incredible conversation. I feel really motivated and inspired. Um, do you have any parting thoughts that you'd like to share as we kind of wrap up this evening? No, just really grateful. Thank you so much to Firestorm and Cindy. Thank you so much for your amazing questions and being here with us and for all of your work as well. And yeah, it's really great to be here. Yeah, they, I think we're just really grateful for the support. And I want to remind folks like the support um firestorm i mean these the spaces are just so important um and us having that kind of two-way relation with them is so critical so i just remind folks to do what you can to support the project that's very sweet thank you yeah. cindy and thanks really, so much yeah thank yep. you thank you all i really it was a joy to be here and i really want to encourage folks to get the book and maybe do reading groups across across different identities <laughs> and different faiths and different it's a really <laughs> really accessible, good book that could spark a lot of great conversations in person. Thank you two uh, so much for creating this book right now. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah. Well, great appreciation to all of you and to everybody who came out tonight. Um, on those notes, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, hope you all have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Yeah, bye. Good night.